Now, I also like to talk about Fan of the Year. That's part of what I do for the show, is attempt to document fanish history that has yet to be documented. And so, one of the things I want to talk about is Fandom of the Era. Now, there was a lot of television that was going on. We were starting to get into some fairly decent, not always brilliant, but fairly decent television of the time. For example, of course, Star Trek was running in its second season in 1968. We had Doctor Who over in Britain. It was the Troughton era, the second Doctor. That was not being aired in the United States. Doctor Who didn't start being aired in the United States until it got on the PBS in the late 1970s, mid-1970s. I've forgotten exactly when. And they started off with the third Doctor. Um, that was my Doctor. That was my doctor. Yes, and the, actually, uh, Larry, Larry, Twi Twilight Zone was gone by then. It had been canceled before that. Um, but it was that era of the Twilight Zone. We also had The Invaders, which was not a bad show. Um, kind of a predecessor, if you think about it, to The X-Files. And we had Land of the Giants, which was a little weird, but fairly intelligent. Tarzan. Uh, not in the movies, not Johnny Weissmuller, certainly by then. Interesting show to watch sometimes. Very different. It was on for several years. Journey to the Unknown, which was an anthology series like The Twilight Zone, where they did one story that was unconnected from the next week's story, and so forth. And there was Lost in Space. Complete crap. If you watch the first few episodes, it looks like maybe it's going to be some intelligent science fiction, and then it rapidly devolves into garbage. Uh, but that was one of Star Trek's actual uh, competitors at the time, as were some of these other shows, and shows that uh, you know you don't necessarily mention, Beverly Hillbillies, Bonanza, things like that. These were all competitors to Star Trek. But we were starting to see some reasonably decent science fiction on television that would generally go away by the end of that decade and not come back until the middle of the next one. There were some good movies and some bad movies. Um, as always with both television, with film, with literature, Sturgeon's Law always holds. Uh, Ted Sturgeon, great science fiction writer, came up with Sturgeon's Law, which states that 90% of science fiction is crap. And there is a corollary to this law that states that 90% of everything is crap. And if you look at what's coming out of Hollywood at any given time, you can say, yep, 90% of everything is crap. And so the movies that we saw this year, some of which I've reviewed the best of, don't think I've reviewed any of the worst. 2001, A Space Odyssey, certainly a big one that year. Barbarella, which I'm reviewing tonight. Planet of the Apes, Brides of Blood, Charlie, Countdown, Destroy All Monsters, which was basically a kaiju movie from uh, Japan. I don't remember if it had uh, Godzilla in it, but it was along those lines. Uh, Genocide, King, I'm sorry, King, King of Kong Island, The Astro Zombies, The Blood of Fu Manchu, The Destructors, The Green Slime, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, this is an interesting one. I, I haven't reviewed it this year. I, I may, the week of Christmas is looking weird for me at this point. I might shove that one in there just because of who's involved and what it is. It was a TV show, but it was a TV movie. Uh, Larry says the first Lost in Space, first season of Lost in Space is good sci-fi adventure. Yeah, yeah. If you watch that first season, especially the first couple of episodes, Doctor Smith is not an idiot. He's an enemy agent. He turned into an idiot when they went to camp and stupidity on that show. Other movies: They saved Hitler's brain, Voyage to the Planet of the Prehistoric Women, and another one that I reviewed this year: Wild in the Streets. However, despite the fact that there were some good things going on in science fiction, most science fiction fans still considered literary science fiction to be the best science fiction of the era. Now, by this point, if you watched when I've talked about science fiction fandom in the 1950s and how big the pulps were as an influence at that point, pulp magazines, at this point, most of the writers that you talk about there had started to move into just plain novels, where instead of having their novels first serialized in the pulps, they were just outright brand new novels. We were starting to see the same sort of thing we see today with novels where they're just brand new novels. And they also had short story collections, generally the best of the short stories that had appeared, were appearing in fan magazines, at the, I mean the regular magazines at the time. Um, 
Oh, yeah, Matt Helm movies. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And like Flint movies. Um, you could conceivably call some of those, uh, you know, science fiction. Also, Bond movies were getting big then and would be big and still are big. And, of course, with Q and all that, they have uh, scientific trappings to them, certainly. But for fans, again, these things as original novels were starting to become a thing. And that is where the uh, magazines, the pulp magazines, started to die off. And you really only, at this point, were seeing some of the best that were still out there. Uh, I think Astounding Stories had changed its name to either Galaxy or Analog. I've forgotten. Some of those are still around, um, but they're not read nearly as widely. Basically, we have moved into a period and stayed after this where we have brand new original novels going on. But as always, as had been the case since about 1926, fans did their own thing. We had fanzines. And as you can see here, not only regular science fiction fanzines, but we were also starting to see the birth of the Star Trek fanzines. Fanzines that were explicitly devoted just to the Star Trek, rather than being devoted to science fiction in general. And we would get these fanzines, and these would continue. These were fan-made magazines. That's why they were called fanzines. Um, they were not of the same general quality uh, that you would see in the uh, pulps and the you know, magazines, science fiction magazines that remained at that time. But fans kept doing it. They had been doing it since the mid-1920s and would keep doing it until the uh, 1980s, into the 1980s, almost to the 1990s. Now, what fanzines meant, and I've mentioned this on other shows, but I always like to do it so that, A, I've got two things going on. I'm going to turn this into a clip. Um, but, B, I don't want viewers who are coming at me for the first time to be lost. I don't want to tell you, go over and watch this other thing. I'm going to talk about it right in the middle. That means my regular viewers sometimes get to hear some of the same things over. But what we did with fanzines was fans would get together, and we didn't have the Internet, but we still had people who wanted to write fan fiction. We still had people who wanted to do fan art. We still had people who wanted to do newsletters that would talk about what was going on in fandom. And so we had fanzines. And Larry says there were lots of Spock fantasy stories. Oh, absolutely. Spock grabbed the attention of women of that era, female fans. And there was all kinds of stuff like to mention it because it started about this time period. You know where the concept of the whole word slash comes from modern day? Well, if your parents are science fiction or Star Trek fans, particularly Star Trek fans, those guys were not the paragon of virtue that you think. I guess they're your grandparents now. They're not the paragon of virtue that they uh, let you on to believe. We started that. We started it first with Kirk slash Spock. That was later shortened to K slash S. And eventually Slash, which was picked up by the science fiction fantasy world at large. We did that with porn stories involving Kirk and Spock. So thank you, grandparents, who were not the paragons of virtue that they might want to make themselves out to be. We could come up with our own, our own perverted crap as well. But there were lots of people who were writing stories, and a lot of it, as you can see here, was starting to be devoted just to Star Trek with a heavy emphasis on Spock. And how we would work this uh, is we would get together, we would have somebody would write a fanfic, somebody would do some art like this, and we put it all together into a um, fanzine, dependent on thickness, could be this thick, could be much smaller, staple them together, and hand them out to other fans. Now, typically, we would at least be able to sell them to our local fan club. So, for example, I don't think I have it. I have to watch and see if it comes around. Um, but the fanzine for my local science fiction club, which still exists today in Lincoln, Nebraska, Starbase Andromeda, the longest-running science fiction and Star Trek fan club in Lincoln, Nebraska. They still meet. And we could pretty much count on selling our fanzine, which was the Kelvin Outpost, to the members of the club. We could not necessarily count on selling it anywhere else. Uh, 
we would at best hope to maybe make back the cost of making them. However, sometimes you would be able to find fans that were somewhere else in the world and you would be able to trade your fanzines for other fanzines. They'd have one that their group put together, you'd have one that you put together, and you'd trade them some kind of swap. And if you were really lucky, you could show up at conventions. Now, there weren't any Star Trek conventions until 1972, but there were lots and lots, well, not lots, but there were some very iconic uh, science fiction conventions where Star Trek was starting to invade. And the old school literary based science fiction fans really hated that. <laughs> they hated it for years and years. Now they're okay with it, but for a long time, they really hated it. But if you got into a con, then maybe you could sell your fanzines just to people in general. But most of the time, you really just hoped that you made enough back to cover the cost of having made the thing in the first place. <laughs> and making these things was no small feat. I was involved in this towards the tail end of this period. What you're seeing here is a mimeograph machine. And that is how we made these things. Now remember, no computers to speak of. The only computers at the time were big mainframe computers that occupied the size of a semi-truck. They'd gotten down. They'd been miniaturized somewhat due to the transistor. They'd gotten down from being the size of a warehouse to the size of a semi-trailer. But you still have in your hand more computing power than they could ever come up with then. You in your hand have more computing power than it took to put man on the moon. But we didn't have computers to do this. We did not have printers. We didn't even have Xerox machines, although we would start getting Xerox machines in the 70s and on uh, later. So what we did was we had a piece of what was called a mimeograph paper. It was a special kind of paper. You would feed that into your typewriter, and then you would type up your story. And the problem was you had to get it perfectly right the first time on that paper because if you didn't if you made a mistake if you made a typo if you didn't spell a word right pull out the paper toss it in the circular file and get a new one and start over and that's how we had to make the things then uh larry says ibm was king yes ibm was the only name in computers basically until microsoft and the pc came along they were the only name in computers and IBM mainframes, as I say, this at that time, the size of a semi-truck and could not do what your phone does today. So what we do is we type this thing up, get it right the first time, which is why typing was an important skill back then. You just didn't make mistakes, and you had to do it as quickly as possible, particularly in the commercial world. You had to do it quick for business. And you had to be right the first time, every time. So you take this mimeograph paper, which you finally got right, <laughs> And you would put it on this drum that you're seeing here, that rolling part. You put it on the drum, and then uh, by the 19s, late 1970s, 60s rather, you weren't necessarily hand cranking it like she did, although you might doing that on an older machine. And you would run it through there, and it, the ink would push through on this special paper and come out on the other side, and you would get a piece of paper with bluish purple ink on it. Um, that's just because of the ink that had to be used at the time. Now, it was often used in schools. It was often used, uh, these things would appear in uh, uh, churches because they would be used to create flyers and leaflets in churches and uh, exams, sometimes quizzes, uh, in uh, schools. Uh, I remember, because way back when, if they couldn't figure out where to put you in a given hour during the day, they would often say, would you like to be the uh, teacher's assistant for the drama teacher, which is what I got one year. And you'd say, sure. And you basically were the drama teacher's gopher. Uh, they would often say to me, he would say to me, okay, I want you to take this down to the teacher's lounge, run off X number of copies on the mimeograph machine. Another thing about those mimeograph machines is they stunk like mad. That ink was terrible. And because, in my case, it was in the teacher's lounge, and there wasn't a ton of ventilation in there, the entire teacher's lounge just stunk like crazy. And this is where teachers would go when they didn't have a class to teach. I always thought, man, this place needs to be fumigated. But the other thing was, you would oftentimes get this ink on your fingers. As a process of doing this, you would get ink stains on your fingers. And this had been the case all the way back since we first had science fiction fandom in the 1920s. <laughs> 
And this gave rise very early on in the 1920s to one of the very first, and I, I don't know if they're still running, but they very well may be, the very first, one of the very first, it's actually the second, but it was the biggest one in New York, the New York Futurians. And a couple of their members came up with a totally fictional god of science fiction called Goo, G-H-U. And Goo's holy colors were purple because of the fact that you would get this purple stains on your finger doing fanzines. And this led to some fanish oaths that I sometimes use. I will often say good God or stuff like that. But if I'm trying not to offend someone, I may uh, swear by goo, because who can get offended by a fictional God? So you might say something like, by goo's purple fingers, by goo's holy purple roads. You won't see me doing that much, but it does happen. I usually use frack, frell, tange, etc. Go around words like that rather than real fictional curse words. Because I don't want to offend anybody, and some people do get offended by that kind of language still. Um, certainly, that uh, kind of coarse language is used almost every day. You can see it everywhere on YouTube, but for, as a general rule, I try to keep it off of my show. So that's what we were doing with 1960s fandom. Uh, all those fanzines and all of that literature and all of those uh, you know, movies and TV shows were now getting into the you know, public consciousness. And uh, whilst people still considered science fiction to some extent, non-fans considered science fiction to some extent to be you know, kind of stupid and out there and why would anybody pay attention to it, it was now starting to become a little more mainstream. It didn't really get mainstream until after Star Wars, but it was starting to become more mainstream.